Okay, so welcome everybody and thank you for coming here despite of the good weather. I know it was a good effort, but <laughs> we'll make it, make it uh, worth your while. So, yeah, we're very happy to be here as speakers. Uh, so far it has been a really wonderful experience to be a speaker in this conference. And for me in particular, I really, I really enjoy it because uh, this is actually the, my hometown where I was born and raised. And it's really great to come here and be able to speak about how to reduce the gender gap and how um, yeah, to introduce more women in tech um, because yeah, this is a topic that's really important for me and we're better than in my hometown. So yeah, happy to be here. So I'm going to introduce ourselves first. Um, here next to me, it's Ansgar. He's a software architect at Reve Digital. And I'm uh, Laura, I'm a software engineer at Commerce Tools. And as you see, I mean, we are you know, architect, engineer. We spend most of our time coding as well as you do. But at some moment, uh, we decided that this was a very important topic. So we brought some initiatives to our companies. At the same time, we were still doing our regular jobs but because we thought it was really important. And that's the reason why we are here, because we want to give you some ideas, some hints, some advice, so that you can do the same in your company. So I'm going to start by showing you this picture. This is me when I was four years old. And it was taken here in Barcelona in the 80s. And it's a little bit hard to see, but I'm playing with a spectrum here. Now I hope it's a little bit easier to see. So this, I show it because it's uh, one of the first times that I was introduced to technology. I mean, probably it was the first picture of me in it with technology. And, and of course, I didn't stop there. Um, I continued growing up with, surrounded by computers, basically, because I really liked it, so I wanted to more and more. And that's how I ended up, probably, um, when it was time to choose the career, I decided, no, it has to be computer science, because this is what I like because I was confident with computers. And that's what I want for all the girls, so that they're able to be introduced to technology in their early childhood so that they have a chance to discover their true passion. So allow me to continue dreaming a little bit more. So women are half of the population, right? Wouldn't it make sense that also 50% of the STEM occupations, so science, technology, engineering, and math, are also occupied by women, half of them? That would be, I mean, natural. Unfortunately, you know this is not the real number. The real number is actually closer to 15 in Europe. And then we can clearly say that women are underrepresented in, in these fields. So what's the problem of women being underrepresented in these fields? So if we fail to introduce more women into STEM, STEM fields, what happens is that, well, you know that currently it's very exciting times for science and technology because we have artificial intelligence and we have nanotechnology and augmented reality and also we have 3D printing. Uh, that's among many other technologies. And all these technologies are available for us to figure out how we can apply them in our lives to improve the way we live. So at this moment, there's already many teams in the world trying to figure out how we can apply it in every single part of our lives. In the near future, these people thinking here are going to decide how we are going to live, how we are going to work, how are we going to transport ourselves, or how are we going to raise our children? Because, yeah, at the moment, these, these teams, we know they are not very diverse. So we are, they're not going to be able to cover everybody's needs. And they're going to decide our future society. We need to be all represented in it. That's why it's very important that we reach this 50% goal in that sense and in many other senses. So, this is actually not the only reason, but it's my most important reason. But there are many others. Um, another reason that also worries me a lot is um, the fact to think of how many women currently, I mean, had brilliant brains for technology, for science, for any other thing. And they didn't figure out, they didn't find out that they had really brilliant minds because 
they didn't even consider it as an option. They were never introduced to technology, so it was never an option for them. And we are losing a lot of potential because of that. I mean, I will wish that every boy and girl in the world are able to choose their, their or discover their true passion because that's how we are going to really discover their potential, their talent. And if we think in a company perspective, it's also, I mean, I don't know how it is here, but in Berlin it's really difficult to hire people. Really difficult. Um, because, I mean, it's normal. We have technology in every business, and of course, therefore, we need people everywhere, and we are not so many. So, now imagine that we could reach the 50% goal. That's, I mean, it's not doubling, but close to. We will have so many people there, and yeah, everything else will move faster, right? And of course, the third, the third um, reason would be the gender pay gap, which you all know very well. So the reason why we have gender pay gap, many, many reasons though. One of them is that um, women is not working in well-paid jobs like ours, or they should be well-paid. But yeah, they are not there, and that's why we also have some gender pay gap. By the way, um, the World Economic Forum, uh, in the last estimation that they did in December last year, they estimated that the gender pay gap is going to be closed in 202 years. And yeah, that's not around the corner. I mean, the good thing is, is they are going to be closed, right? But it's not going to be in our generation, nor the next, nor the next, nor the next. <laughs> and we have to really accelerate this. Now, we have seen why we need more women in technology and in other fields. Why don't we have more women in these fields? So there's an OSCD report. So OSCD is this organization that does also the PISA reports, the educational ones. Um, some years ago, they did a special report about diversity. And one of the things they, they, they have in the report is that less, less than 5% of the girls want to pursue a, a career in computing or engineering. Less than 5% compared to almost 20% of the boys. And that's yeah, the same in Europe, more or less. So I wanted to find out why. And as I started gaming, that was my motivation to uh, come into computer science. And probably it's many of you also the reason. So I looked into gaming, of course. Um, and you know that yeah, girls have never been associated with hardcore gamers. But actually, since we have um, smartphones, since we all have smartphones in our pockets, actually girls have been playing more and more, I mean, in a daily basis. So it is true that, yeah, maybe girls are not still playing many on consoles, I mean, Wii and this kind, but not so many, but in smartphones they're playing a lot. So I wanted to see what kind of games they were offered. And that's why I went into Google Play Store and I searched for the word boys to see what it will bring me. So what it bring me is um, these kind of games. They were quite diverse. I mean, there's really a little bit of everything. There's no particular color or no particular style or anything. It was quite generic. So then I went and I searched for girls and one would expect to receive such a neutral results, right? What I saw is this kind of results. So there's a clear color, predominant, <laughs> it was pink, almost everything. Also the topics were how to be a um, singer, a model, a princess, uh, hairdressing, nail polishing, makeup, these kind of things. So I decided to go into another perspective. So instead of the games that were offered to girls, I wanted to see games like STEM games um, that are these kind of sets, um, technology, I mean, electronics, chemics, and to do experiments and, and learn by playing. And I wanted to see what do they look like. So I went to Amazon. I must say it was Amazon Germany. And I looked into the first 50 pages, and what I saw is that like half of them were picturing only boys on the cover, and the other half were picturing boys and girls together. 
So it was already quite bad, the fact that only boys in, in half of the covers. I mean, that means that half of the games are not targeting girls. But actually, that was not the worst part. For me, the worst part was that I found like a three or four games that were picturing only girls, but they looked like this. It was um, yeah, very pink and shiny, and also it was about cosmetics, soaps, perfumes, and this kind of stuff. I mean, we cannot blame marketing because in the end they are trying to sell products. And in the end, what girls and boys are seeing home is not much better. So, of course, they don't see many, many female engineers. They don't see many male caregivers, like, such as uh, senior care or kindergarten teachers or nurses. And then we are trying to tell them, like, hey, you have to be one of those. You have to be different. When kids are afraid of being different so much. So if they don't have role models that make them confident, it's very difficult to tell them to be different. Also, they see that we classify mm, toys by gender. So we insist that um, yeah, certain toys are for certain genders, and you may think that it's not a problem, it's toys in the end. But actually, toys are the first educational tools that any kid will use to start exploring the world, to start learning. And, and these toys, for example, when, when you play with a toy car, I mean, it already gives you some notions on mechanics and physics. And when you play with dolls, it's telling you, I mean, it's teaching you how to take care of another human being. So they are there for something. And when, you, when, when a kid is not playing to some of them, when they are rejecting it, and most of the time they're rejecting it because of pressure from their peers, from their family, or from themselves, then, of course, these career paths are going to feel very, very far away from them. And then it's very unlikely that they are going to follow something like that. Also, um, we, the kids keep hearing us in comments and jokes based on the stereotypes. And to illustrate that, I'm going to use this commercial. And I know it's a commercial, it's fiction. Uh, there are actors, there's a script behind, of course. But it still makes a very good point. So in this commercial, for those who haven't seen it, um, they tell some adults to fight, to run, and to throw like a girl. And they know about the negative connotation that doing something like a girl has. So what they're doing is they're like running very effortless, very, in a ridiculous way. Um, they are really like overdoing it. And yeah, that's what they're doing. So they're asking the little girls to do the same. And these little girls, supposedly, they haven't heard about this negative connotation. So what they do is, of course, they, 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 they are fighting really hard, they are running very fast, and they are throwing very far. Of course, there will be a moment in which they will hear about these comments, because we have all heard them. And the moment they hear it, they are going to lose confidence on those skills. They are not going to feel yeah, like they can do it so better. So that's what happens, actually. So the kids see these stereotypes, and then their confidence on these skills drops. And when you do something with low confidence, it's going to end up that you are not going to perform it much better. Because when they, telling, they are telling you, like, no, you, do it, you don't do it very well, and you cannot do it very well, and you believe it, of course, it's not going to work very well. And when you perform worse, and then from your eyes and from the eyes of everybody, this reinforces this stereotype. And this is feeding this vicious cycle. And we really need to break out of this vicious cycle. So how can we break out of it? This is a, this is a, a team task. So we have to, as a team, work on that. The more people that join trying to change this, the faster it's going to end. The faster, more than 200 years, hopefully. So less than 200 years. And so what we have to do is, for once, um, we have to be aware that we all have bias. So, I mean, I have bias and I know it. But because I know it, I can fight it. And we all have bias because bias is the product of stereotypes. 
and we have all been surrounded by stereotypes, so it's natural. And some stereotypes, some bias have been dropped because we have the lack maybe to work with um, multicultural teams or with very diverse uh, neighborhoods or whatever. But some of them won't. So in these ones, we really have to be aware of when we are being biased and try to fight it. Also, we have to try to raise awareness, like we're doing here today. So go to your families, go to your colleagues, go to your friends and tell them that we have a problem and that we can all do something to accelerate the end of this problem. And last, we can also uh, compensate with positive discrimination. And this can be a little bit controversial because, you know, you're trying to fight, uh, you're trying to fight discrimination with discrimination, right? That may sound weird. But actually, I mean, you have to think that, ideally, kids, boys and girls will start in the same starting point, right? But the problem is that girls have like then some stereotypes, then some yeah, negative influences, then some um, uh, the marketing, the commercials, everything. So they end up in this position. So actually they don't have the same opportunities. So what we have to do is just make them a push. This will be the positive discrimination to put them back in the starting line together with the boys. Or if it's the boys what you're trying to help, then it will be the other way around, right? But the idea is to always compensate to put them back together in the same starting line. So this is precisely what now my colleague Ansgar is going to explain you how you can do it. Yes, so um, I think we can agree that there is a problem and we all see it around us when you look around at conferences, when you look around in your, um, in your offices, you, you probably see those 15% um, women working there, and this is something we think we definitely need to change. Um, so we, we also learned that stereotypes kick in very early in, in, in the childhood. So um, what, what we think is that we, we should start focusing on it on, on, at the age around six, and um, we should start early, and we should um, enable the girls to play with technology and get, get some connection to technology. Um, playing with technology is the other thing, so they are still kids, right? So they, they want to play and it's very easy for them to, to learn something during the, 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 the play. The only thing is that you have to break it down a little bit. And the, the good thing about this one is everyone who is a developer or works in, in software engineering knows how to break things down. This is what we do all day long. So um, you got a big problem, you make multiple smaller problems out of it as long as you can fix those small problems and then you put it all together again and solve probably the big problem. And this is what you um, probably have to do when you work with kids, um, then you, you probably need to just figure out a way to make it a little bit smaller and um, give them a good start with it. And, um, as, as you all know, there are studies out there um, about healthy workplaces, and um, those studies show that um, you, you have, a, have to have a workplace full of curiosity. This is why the offices look so colorful um, if you want to create something, and um, this is the, the thing you can start easily with with your kids. So to discover new things, um, you, you can give them an old radio, an old computer, and just let them tear it down and have to have a look what's inside. What's inside a hard disk? How does the disk really look like? So it's probably um, a little bit out of time because hard disks are getting less and less produced and it's uh, tricky to find one, but those things, you probably never use them again, so you can just give them, open them up, and see how they work from the inside. Um, when we talk about exposing kids to technology, um, we, we should also talk about those conferences we are going to as a speaker, as attendees, and this is another way to, to just give your kids an environment where they, where they see technology, where they see other people working in technology and see those um, more or less uh, diverse groups, but they, at least they see role models um, there and they can 
um, they can adapt to it and they get exposed to technology, they get used to it, so start thinking about it, bring your kids to conferences and when you buy your next ticket, ask if there's childcare at the conference where you can, um, where you can take care of your kid and where you have a quiet room for, for this or if you submit a talk, um, ask if you can bring your partner to look after the kid while you're giving the talk. So there need to be a second ticket maybe, something, something like this. So, and there are already good examples out there. So when we have a look, this is a tweet from Trisha G. She's working for JetBrains, <coughs> sorry. And um, she, she found um, a parenting room at QCon in London and was um, obviously surprised, but this is the way it needs to go. So you need to find a place where you can take care of your children, where you have a quiet area, no one comes in and goes out all the time. So this is one start conferences can do. Um, even more of this is, uh, this is uh, Sebastian Blanc um, working for Red Hat um, and he's even giving talks together with his kids. So he brings the, his kids on the stage giving talks with them about probably uh, about similar things we are talking about in the, in the second part. So try think about those things and think about how to, to integrate kids um, with your technology life and bring them to the offices, bring them to conferences. Um, when we speak about curiosity, um, the thing is that um, it, it is not a problem that, that you have an ambitious goal to, 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 to tackle. So um, we think give kids challenging uh, challenges they, they can tackle for a long time, but in the end they will solve it. So from, from my person, it was the same as Laura said, so I started somehow with gaming, so there was a computer, I want to put the games on it, and I somehow need to figure out how to compile a Linux kernel back in this time. There was all those modules in the kernel and you have the right module or the wrong module for the graphic card in there. So you need to figure out a way how to get the graphic card working to play games on the computer. And um, you might think this is nothing for 12 or 14 year old kids, but in the end, um, you try over and over again. You, I cannot remember how often I installed Linux again from the disk and then tried it again, compile, nothing works anymore, okay, start over. So uh, this, is, this is the way you, you learn things really well. Um, in our days, it's probably starting with um, tearing the old hard drives apart, but um, to figure things out, it's probably more like 3D printing. So get a 3D printer to work, connect it to your computer, because no one needs to compile Linux kernels anymore uh, in the sizes of how, how many gigs of RAM you have in your computers. So, um, and probably this is the way most of you started your technology career. So you somehow figured out this, is, this could be interesting. You open it up, you have a look inside, wondering what is all, what is all this about, and um, gave it a try. So why not moving on with this? Um, speaking of curiosity, this is something we also do in our company. So um, we organize several events all over the company uh, where we invite colleagues from, from different departments, not, not only from technology, and bring their ideas into those events and have a few days working on those idea uh, on those ideas beside the day-to-day -day work. So there's always something more important than the next, uh, the next technology stack you learn from the conference, the next idea, and there's always something, some feature requests which is, which is more important. So we have a time where we um, have one week, three days to work on those um, crazy ideas and bring them to life as far as we can. Other companies are doing this as well, so um, the idea or um, the recommendation is just go to YouTube and search for hackathons and uh, hack weeks, hack days, and you will find videos from those companies and see what they do for the adults. This is the thing you can do in your company if you want to have fun. And um, what we did is we decided, okay, we have this running for several times. And we know it's working for the colleagues and for the, for the adults in the company. Why not, um, and walking around in conferences, you see DevOps for kids, you see Javaland for kids, there's JBCN for kids. So um, the idea was basically to use this event and make a prequel of it, where we introduce, uh, where we in invite 30 girls to the company at the age from seven to 17. So it should be kids, no adults, um, teens, obviously, and 
the seven is more about they, they need to read something. So they don't need to be perfect in reading and writing, but it's good if they have a start already, so this makes it easier. Um, this is what we do with a prequel. We also, you can also look around. There's girls who code. There's uh, women in tech, DevOps for kids, and you find plenty of material there, what you can do with the kids in this, in this day. Um, the um, last thing is we, we learned in the first part from Laura why we think it's important to start with a group of girls only and why we don't want to have a mixed group there. This is the main reason we have, but we also talked to other people organizing, organizing those events and it seemed to be easier to not have boys in there grabbing the keyboard the moment it doesn't work and let me figure this out and I will, I will, I will code this and you, you would just have to look. So we want to avoid this situation very clearly and this is the, another reason why we decided to go for a homogeneous group um, of girls. And of course, um, parents bring their kids, co-workers asking us, um, why don't you organize it for mixed groups? Or why don't you organize it for boys? I have two boys, I have no daughters. And they, they, are, uh, they, they also want to attend. And um, with the first event we organized, we sat together afterwards in the, in the group of, uh, of the people mentoring there. And one colleague came up with the, uh, with the very good answer, and this is the one I, I always give since then. So we will organize it for everyone the moment the gender pay gap is closed. So it's up to you, <laughs> it's up to you to make it less than 200 years and, until we offer it. So we do it on Sundays, it's our time, and this is our decision to, uh, to focus on, on girls. And the moment this is solved, we don't have a problem to solve, and then we can focus on everyone. So let's have a look how such a day looks like. So we're starting in the morning. It's, it's, it's a Sunday, as I said, so we're starting in the morning. We take over the kids and we have breakfast together. So the parents are not there anymore. So they probably get a tour through the, through the office, and, but then they leave. So they are not there the whole complete day. Um, we get to know each other. Um, the kids get to know each other. And we do some warm-up games. Uh, where do you come from, sort by age, so things like this. Uh, next step is, what is a computer? And where are computers? Um, how do they work? So very easy things, and um, how do they work? Probably not, but uh, you can, again, reduce it and then tell um, the simplified version of, of instructions and probably a bakery re receipt. Um, you can compare to this. So computers are everywhere. They are in washing machines, in cars, in... Uh, in your radio, in your laptop, in your mobile phone, obviously. So this is the things you can discover there. In the morning, we also use Scratch, you see later, um, just to play around. Uh, there's a short introduction into Scratch, which is a block programming language you can use online in the browser, uh, which is very easy to, to handle. So this is the first contact with real programming. And after every block, we also introduce the short retrospective, like we do in our in our day-to-day -day work life. So at, when the sprint ends, there's a retrospective. What went well? Where did you need help? Where could you give help someone uh, someone else in the group? So these are the things we are asking there. And what we also do is we are working in pairs. So um, also adapted from our work uh, work life. So we are doing pair programming one day long. So with the kids as well. Of course, kids in the age between 7 and 17, uh, they are kids, so they are not used to sit in the office all day long, and um, this is uh, important to, to really get everything, everyone outside. So um, put, it, put aside your smartphone, don't produce the next Insta story or something like this, just let's go outside, run around, and figure out um, what is not computer and not sitting in a chair. Um, in the end of the day, we started, or in the afternoon, we start to introduce hardware devices we have over here. And in the end, we start with something awesome to build. So in the end, the kids can build their own computer games. And you will see one of them tonight. So it's quite, it's only a few lines of code, but it's a real game. And you can play it with two of those devices, one versus another. So, um, when you want to organize, and this is what we want to encourage you, as Laura said, when you want to organize such events at your company, at your Java user group, um, it's easier to have support from the, your company or from your Java user group, so not, not doing this on your own. 
Um, it's easier if you can some, spend some work time uh, planning these things out and do the papers for uh, preparing all the things. And if you have colleagues or Java user group members helping you out on this day, so usually for 30 girls we have between 10 and 15 adults in the, in the office and uh, this also helps if you have someone to recruit it and you don't, don't have to go um, on the street and ask people you don't know um, if they want to help out. It's, way, it's getting easier if you find some sponsoring. So at least if you, it's, it's one complete day, you can figure out other ways everyone brings something, but it's easier if you get some sponsoring and you can buy some food for this day, for the breakfast, for the lunch, maybe something for the afternoon, some sweets. And um, what is always welcome, and you see it probably in most of, your stick, uh, most of your laptops, stickers are always welcome. So if you produce stickers for those events, they are not very expensive, but um, everyone will grab multiple of them and is uh, happy to share them on the, in the school or at home with their siblings. And so some money, some sponsoring is good there. Uh, get into public and talk to the parents. So what we do is we use the intranet, which is quite easy in a big company with about 380,000 people working there. So it's easy to spread the word. But also the Java user groups have big mailing lists you can reach out. And you, they, they, I'm sure they are happy to help to spread the word. And if you have sponsors in there, they are often also very, um, very eager to help with this topic. So it's um, quite, quite easy to get at least some attention. Um, what surprised me a little bit is um, it's a good idea to keep the parents in a tight loop. So they are not used to, at least um, this is what, what we experienced, they are not used to uh, good information. So usually they get a paper from the school, you have to sign it, we are going somewhere else, uh, and that's it. So you sign it and uh, the kids get out of school for one day to a museum or something like this. And if you keep them in a tight loop, this is what we do in the morning, this is what we program, this is the IDE which we will use, this is what we do outside, this is where we're doing in the afternoon. All those things tell also the parents so they can follow up on this and they can uh, use the computers at home and ask questions, how was the day, what did you do there, what did you do there? And um, the kids are eager to show. So this is also the feedback we get. Um, the girls come home and say, Dad, you have a computer in the basement. I need to show you something. And firing up the computer that night, they're coming home and showing what they did um, is, is happening a lot. Of course, there's always something. And uh, there is some legal stuff you have to do, you, you have to take into consideration. Um, you have, what we do is we have a formal registration. First, we use um, Google Docs to, to make sure who is joining this, this event, and later on we get approvals with the signature from the parents, where we, where we also make sure usage of internet is okay and going outside the office building is okay under supervision. So all those things you need to figure out. And um, this is also the, the place where you can ask for special medication, for special dietaries, for allergies. So things you probably want to know uh, when you need to know them. So, and uh, there's of course, uh, at least in Europe, um, probably for most of you, the GDPR comes in last year. So taking pictures and even sharing them with the parents and the kids attending the event is not so easy and costs us four more pages of paperwork just to make a zip file, send it around to all the parents and uh, have the pictures in there. But um, it's possible and we are currently working with the lawyers to, to make a version we can put on a CC license in, into our GitHub repository so you can at least have a starting point and adopt it. So back to Laura about the details. Yeah. Um, so. I'm going to show you a little bit about what you can do in um, a more technical area. So to recap from what Ansgar explained, very important that your technical team, the team of mentors that you're going to have, uh, are aware that they need to motivate the girls with ideas. So, I mean, the girls just come in, they don't know about this technology, they don't know everything that the technology is capable of. So when you see that they are like, running in circles, they don't come up with new ideas, bring them in. Tell them, what if you do this? What if you do the other thing? That's very important. Then also, make sure they don't get frustrated. Because when they get frustrated, it's going to be even worse than if they never came in the first place. 
the idea there is that it, ha it has to be something easy that they can follow up, that they can see that technology is not so difficult. It's cool. You can do a lot of things with it. That's the idea. They have to live with this motivation. And then also make sure that you're there to help. But don't take over the keyboard and the mouse and start doing everything. No, no. You let them do it. They have to just ask for your help if they need, if they're stuck, and you tell them what to do. Maybe you, you just guide them. But they have to feel like they did everything on their own. And the most important thing is that make sure that at least 50% of your mentors are women, because otherwise we are missing the role model part. And of course, probably you will think like, yeah, we don't have so many women, technical women in our company, so it's going to be difficult. Well, that's, I know that because that's why we are here, but you do, it doesn't have to be technical. I mean, it's just uh, something we are teaching little kids to do, right? So it cannot be that difficult. Just bring anybody non-technical, POs, HR, marketing, sales, whatever. They just have to be willing to do this and, and, and motivated and just do a workshop of one hour, they will get it. It's not so difficult. And yeah, so the first um, software I'm going to show you is a Scratch. So who of you have heard of Scratch before today? As I guess that. Yeah, I mean, it's the most, uh, most popular one. It's made by MIT, and it, has, it is very, very uh, powerful. I mean, you can do um, any kind of uh, stories, video games with this kind of interface. And yeah, it has no limit. And you can draw your own thing, so it's really great. And you can program it with um, this uh, editor. It's a... Uh, it's, um, it's a visual language, uh, visual programming language with blocks, and it, yeah, I mean, everything actually what we are going to show you is with visual programming with blocks, because so far it's the best way for kids to learn. And yeah, I mean, it's really great. Um, the only thing that you have to be very careful about is that it's really great for our creative kids. Um, they come up with great ideas uh, of stories and games. Be careful they don't get distracted because they can start painting and painting and not programming. <laughs> so just be careful with that because we have many cases that they just get engaged with that. So another options, which are my favorite ones, is these devices. So Calliope Mini and BBC Microbit, for example. These two have lots of sensors. They're very similar. They have um, a thermometer. They have um, um, acceler um, um, accelerometer, they have a um, um, speaker, a microphone, a light sensor, LED uh, screens, uh, RGB LED and buttons. They have plenty of things you can play with. And they cost between 20 and 40 euros maximum. So they're quite economic. Of course, you can also have Lego ones. They don't have so many sensors, but they are really good to get started and to learn some basics but they're also very, very expensive. So, I mean, they're not going to be less than 130 euros if you're very lucky. So, depending on your budget, you can choose one thing or the other. And all of them, you can program them with make code, for example. This is so far the best editor, the one we like the best. And it's great because, well, I mean, all this, uh, you have, the, of course, the, the blocks there, and you have also a uh, virtual device that you can use without having to download it every time to the device. That's good. But the best part of it is if you look at up there, it, it says JavaScript next to blocks. That means that you can switch the code, and you can go from code, so from block to JavaScript code. And you can switch it. So you can program here a little bit, there a little bit, and they're all the time synchronized. This is a great way for kids to go from a visual programming language to something that it's more used in our daily business. So that's the way you can you know, continue the learning also. And uh, yeah, now for the ideas. So start um, the sessions with very basic stuff. Um, just tell them to do something like uh, that has an input and has an output. So for example, press a button and show your name. or shake the device and show the temperature. Something that they can just explore all the sensor, all the devices, all the buttons and all the LEDs that it has. Once they have, they, they know the way around, then tell them to do something, um, something that they can apply to real life, like a thermometer. So that they can, um, there's a light maybe that shows blue or 
or red or green, depending on the temperature of the room. That's a possibility. They already do some conditionals, and so it, and it's really a cool thing to taste. Also, um, tell them like to do something that involves loops and things like that, so they can already uh, start understanding a little bit all the programming part. Then it comes the games. So find some games that are easy to to program, but they are like fun playing. So for example, this uh, this is a multiplayer runner, and you can see it's really short. I mean, there's not it's really not complicated, and with just some step by step guide that you can do to guide them a little bit on maybe you can put this here, this pixel there, and this pixel there, move it, and just to introduce them on how to make video games, then it's very easy to implement. And last, you can also connect things because uh, both the, the, the Calliope and the Microbit has some, um, uh, yeah, some connectors that you can create, uh, um, I mean, it has a negative pole and a positive pole, and then you can create a, a closed circuit, and then it will detect that, that the current is passing, and then it's when it will react. So for example, in this one, it's created a piano that you can play later here. It's just when you, um, yeah, you create the, the current in every, in every pin, then it's going to play a tone. And you can see it in action in this video. If it loads, we should be loading. And if we hear it, hopefully, let's hope. No, it's only here. OK. Well, yeah. <laughs> if the audio is not there, then we are not going to hear it. Oh, well, I mean, we can also hear it there. It was playing music. I mean, you can see it's just the forks and the and everything you find there, scissors, and you just, with the negative pole, then you touch every one of them, and it plays a different, a different uh, sound. And you miss that I was playing some nice music there, but it's a pity. Anyway, um, so let's um, open it. Well, OK, now it's just a small, anyway. So um, anyway, you can find all the code, all the different code for all, the, all these games, all these ideas that we show them. You can find it in this repository. And um, yeah, and then you can come here to see these books that they are very interesting because they are trying also to break some stereotypes. There are uh, some games there, the asteroids and the, and the piano and the, the multiplayer runner. And yeah, so thank you very much for coming. And do you have any question? <laughs> oh, hi. Uh, as you can see, I'm a man. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's, it's one of the things I'd like to do. It's like what you guys are doing. I find it amazing, really. And uh, this, the company I work for, as I said, uh, there's not much women, and they are not so interested in, in creating this kind of stuff, because I've tried before. And uh, the thing is, as a man, it's really hard for me to speak in the name of women, because I, I, I don't have place, I, I cannot speak. But it, how can I, I mean, how can I as a man work around it to, because I, I want to help this community, I want to help grow it, but I, f I feel like I don't have the tools, I lack um, I don't know. I, I I don't know where to start, basically, because I don't know the motivation inside the company, inside the girls in the company is really hard for me. So as a man, how can I help? I think you're from, you're from better to answer this. <laughs> you can. Um, so what I basically did is just started. So I asked around who wants to attend, and um, everyone said, oh, I'm not into programming. I don't know how this works." And the the answer to this is you're gonna show the seven-year-old kids and you don't think that you can learn it in one afternoon. And um, so I think this is, this is the easy thing. So you can teach it, everyone in the room probably understood what you saw on the screen. And even if you're not into coding, you understand it within one hour of explanation. So and then um, you get 
those devices. So the, the mentors get those devices for one or two days over the weekend and can play around with it and, and get used to it. And that's pretty much it. So um, don't stop asking around. This is the first thing. Um, probably don't start in your company. If, if your company wants to support you, but there are no people who wants to support you, um, ask your company to sponsor and use the Java user group to recruit people working with you on this topic. And um, as Laura said, so um, you, should, you should be aware that not only uh, middle-aged white men are in the group of mentors. So this is, uh, this is the tricky part, yes, but um, it, it doesn't mean that that doesn't have to be a man. So we usually have 10 to 15 adults there and two, three, four men are also working with us. More questions? Hi, thank you very much. Um, okay, I, I suppose, or, or in my mind, mathematics, physics, and obviously uh, computer science are disciplines where the gap between genders shouldn't exist. Obviously, it's pretty obvious, or, or it sounds pretty obvious, but they do. They are there. And you, bring to, you, you brought us a lot of good ideas in order to encourage children to have a different, a different mind in their future as we have. But what do you think happens with the current adults? Is there any hope for them? What can we do not just asking as a man? Because, yeah, it's difficult, but do you think we can do anything? Yeah, I mean... Um, Even more, obviously. Yeah. It's always... I, I, I mean... I think it's always too few things what we can do, and I'm trying to uh, put all my hopes in children, but <laughs> I'm a bit frustrated about about adults. Yeah, Thank you. I mean, of course, for example, there's also adult women currently that are trying to learn, and uh, also girls that maybe were not introduced at the beginning, but they are also willing to learn. So I've seen this. For example, um, you can you can bring maybe um, women that want to try to to be in the technical area, and you can mentor them. So I'm 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 mentoring a, um, also a woman in my company that started just one year and a half ago with technology, and I'm there mentoring her every day to make sure that she she gets to be a really good developer. And so. You can do mentoring for sure, and of course make sure to also apply processes maybe in your company, such as processes that help in removing the bias. For example, one thing I try to put in my company, and it's a little bit difficult, is to remove the names from the applicants. So when, when you get the curriculum and you already see that it's a woman or whatever and it's coming from this place and I don't know, you're already like building a lot of stereotypes, biases and stuff and you cannot help it, you know? But what you can do is maybe remove the name so that the first pass, I mean, of course, you're going to talk to that person anyway later, but for the first step, they already pass in equal opportunities. Um, yeah, I mean, you can do many things like that for the today's people. Um, and yeah, and of course, trying to also make sure that people around you understand that and do the same as you probably will do. That is like try to realize all the bias that, that we have and fight it. And even in, in companies we all work for, make sure that um, that there is no gender pay gap. So um, make sure that men and women earn the same money for the same job and that, that this is at least taken care of in your company. So you can, you can start in your own workplace and go to your boss and tell, tell him about it and ask how, how is it handled in this company? Who is taking care of this? And who is in charge for making sure that this is not happening? Yeah. Also, internal recruiting that is uh, fair and that is taking everybody into account and not so much by finger. There are many things that can affect uh, that women get into higher positions or in different positions. So. Half a minute left. Maybe we get one more question. 
One more question. Hiya. Um, great talk. I have a, question, a personal question for you, Laura. Um, I find these days with the positive discrimination that sometimes it works against us and that people think because we're getting this positive discrimination, a lot of comments I've got from being invited to, to conferences and talking at conferences have been that um, it's just because I'm a woman and they just let them in to anything now. And I find that annoying that that sort of diminishes the work that you've put in. I was just wondering if you sort of find that as well and if you had any sort of tips or things that you do in those sort of cases. Um. I mean, um, yeah, positive discrimination is, is uh, primarily because that's a thing people will think maybe you got the position because of whatever. Um, it's more the problem of how the process was made for this. I mean, I think quotas are important because we need role models. I mean, for me, that's the priority number one. And um, yeah, and if, uh, if you are in a conference because you are a woman, but you come with a great talk, what does it matter? I don't know. It's, um, you really don't have to worry about that that much. Um, I would say just focus on making sure that you are a role model for everybody and ignore a little bit any other thing. Just make sure you, I mean, we are doing to, to do it great anyway, so <laughs> don't have to worry so much. There's always to be this talk. Thank you, that's really good advice. It's blinking up, up here. <laughs> so we are out of time. Um, if you have further questions, so you can have a look at the devices. Probably it's, uh, it's the last session, right? So we don't have to take care of another speaker. So if you want to have a look at the devices and could spare a few minutes from the party, um, we can show you how they work and uh, the games are on the devices. Uh, the piano is there. Um, don't forget to vote when you, when you leave the talk. So um, we got encouraged to come here next year. Um, thank you very much for being here and uh, have a good night and a great conference tomorrow. Yeah.